Um, hello and welcome to our webinar. Uh, my name is Melissa Smith. I'm the Managing Editor of Content Solutions here at Housing Wire. Um, and you are joining us today for our webinar, The Key to Retaining Your Borrowers Post Refi Boom, sponsored by Capacity and Sales Boomerang. Before we get started, I've got just a couple of housekeeping items. The first is that we are going to reserve some time after the webinar for a Q&A session. So feel free to drop any questions either in the chat or using that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, second, Housing Wire will be sending a webinar recording to all registrants in the next 24 hours. We are joined by three panelists. And if we could go to that next slide here so I can try and pronounce everyone's last names. We've got <laughs> Kevin Peranio, Chief Lending Officer at PRMG. We've got David Karandish, Co-Founder and CEO at Capacity. And then Alex Kutsushin, co-founder and CEO of Sales Boomerang. How'd I do, Alex? Uh, A plus, that, that may have been the best pronunciation ever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we can't talk about the post-refi boom without first talking about how we got here in the first place. Um, so just looking back at 2020, at the beginning of 2021, or I'm sorry, at the beginning of 2020, mortgage rates were already pretty low. Um, home sales were up within those first two months and Mortgage rates were hovering at about 3.5 for a 30 year fix. So things were looking good from the housing wire side. I can tell you our newsroom was busy covering market projections from all the industry experts. Things were looking really positive. And then March happened. And I'm sure I don't have to rehash for anyone the fact that our economy came to a screeching halt. Um, we all went to working from home. I've been in sweatpants since last year. <laughs> It was a crazy time. Um, from the purchase market perspective, the housing market took a pretty steep but surprisingly short-lived nosedive. Um, according to the Mortgage Bankers Association, we only really saw nine weeks of negative year-over-year -year data for purchase applications. And then things went back up. So that's really what no one was expecting there. Um, and then from the lender side, they were busy the entire time. I think all of our LOs are stressed, underwriters are stressed, everyone's busy, but they were also doing incredible business. It was a banner year as everyone on here can attest. Mm -hmm. um, just to throw some numbers out there to back that up, by the end of 2020, $4.3 trillion in mortgages were originated. 2.8 trillion of that alone was in refinancing. Now in Q2 of 2021, we're seeing a slowdown as rates go up, and I'm going to pass the baton over to Kevin Peranio to unpack what's become of the refi boom. Kevin, I'm going to quote you directly from a recent Bloomberg article in which you said, every single time a refinance boom ends, it ends violently and suddenly. <laughs> Does that hold true today? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thanks for, for having us on here, Melissa, and obviously, you know, my esteemed colleagues over there with David and Alex. You know, it, it was interesting, you know, this this is um, I've been through probably about four cycles fully at this point now. And it is crazy, you know, when um, mortgage backed securities, when they lose value, our rates go up and the bond traders and bond markets, you know, they just you know, they're watching what's going on and they think we're really rebounding. They think the economy is growing. And so, you know, just to give a little more context, we were um, we saw about 400 basis points come out of the two coupon uh, in four weeks. So at the end of January, uh, like I believe January 25th, 28th, right around there, for four weeks, it just evaporated. Plus you add another 50 basis points of adverse market fee that the FHFA taxed, you know, our, our homeowners, you know, you have 450 basis points just disappeared. So um, I think the latest Black Knight data has said that refis and eligible borrowers for refinance that would receive a, a benefit is down 40 percent, mm -hmm. and um, and that that's quick. I mean, it doesn't mean rates aren't still good and there's not a lot of business, but the word boom, you, you can't use the word boom when you have that much um, loss of eligible borrowers and and um, and so you know it's back to block hand tackling, which I think is a great uh, perfect timing to have a call like this and and talk about how we're going to do that. Perfect. So then to kick us off, um, post refi, how do you hold on to all of the borrowers you just captured? Yeah, I, I love this, uh, this question because, you know, um, at Alex and I, uh, we've been working together going on three years now. 
uh, with Sales Boomerang and um, three you know, glorious all, years. I know it's been great, right? And <laughs> I I wore my my purple jacket that I that you and I we always send to wear the same jacket at all the trade shows and conferences. <laughs> Um, and I got my capacity shirt, so I'm giving some love to both my peeps. Yeah. But, you know, um, what's interesting is, um, you, you know, uh, I think one of the terms that you guys use over there at um, at Sales Boomerang is churn. You know, how do you keep your bars from, you know, getting stolen? And if you're an originator or, or realtor, uh, a realtor, that's your borrower. That's mm -hmm. your borrower. That's not the portfolio manager's borrower. That's not the bank, the hedge fund. Every originator knows that they're the one that went and found that borrower and created that relationship. So how do you keep in touch with them? How do you keep them from going away? Alex and I will debate about how many loans exactly people do in their life, whether it's nine or whether it's 11. But if you put a first time home buyer uh, in a home or if you help someone with a the refinance, they're going to do cash out later. They're going to buy other properties. And God willing, if they live long enough, they may do a heck of um, also known as revert, uh, reverse mortgage. So you want to keep in touch with these borrowers, even though they may have locked in the lowest rates ever, mm -hmm. and maybe you know a rate and term might not make sense. They're going to do other loans, and they're going to have other people to refer you know to you. So we use a lot of tech tools, and we help um, keep the relationship going. And I think that's kind of it. Kind of gets back to blocking and tackling. Of course. None of it replaces getting on the phone and having a relationship, an ongoing discussion with your client, with your business partner and saying, hey, you know, just a little checkup. How are things going? Do you know anybody looking? You know, technology helps you do more of the relationship stuff. And that is that's the point of using all the tech tools. Yeah. And, and if I could just throw something in on there, Kevin, what's interesting is because of what happened, because of how low the rates were, um, there may even be a greater distance between the next transaction. Right. And so. It's, it's like uh, probably, probably going on a month, month and a half, uh, uh, we spoke to someone that shared with us that their team feels like all the deals they did last year, they'll never get again because there's going to be way too far of a distance. There's no benefit they can offer their client. And, and that is exactly the, the, the mindset they're trying to reverse. But like, no, like those people are going to do something again. This is not their final loan. These aren't Heckam loans, right? These, these loans will change. People's circumstances will change. Life will happen. And it's actually more relevant now than ever because you put somebody in the best possible loan they can get, right? I mean, there's no lower they can go. And it's thanks to you. You want to bring that back into the relationship, as you mentioned, Kevin, like it's about the relationship. So I think now more than ever, the fact that you did a loan and put somebody in the greatest possible loan that they're going to have in their life it's, it's making sure you're there for them for the next one. Um, and I think because of the great loan that they're in, people feel like, oh, well, I can't help them anymore. That's it. That's Well, you can work from anywhere. Good. Yeah. I mean, you can work from anywhere. I'm, I'm working in my car. Yeah. You know, I'm literally, I'm, I'm, I'm not the only one that's got four kids on spring break and hiding in their car. So, <laughs> you know, it, and I'm just, gonna, you know, look, these home prices in the housing supply is a real issue. So in a year or two from now, a lot of these bars we just refinance, they may, you know what? I don't, I can't imagine how much money I'm going to get if I sell this house and they're going to dump it and they're going to go move out to the sticks somewhere because they can work from anywhere. And so, right. yeah, I agree that let's not be narrow sighted on, um, you know, the fact you just did someone a rate and term, the game has definitely changed. Nice. Yeah. The other thing I'll add to this part of the conversation, I was seeing, I saw a stat the other day from Stratmore talking about how 87% of borrowers work with a lender either through an existing relationship or uh, through referral. And so keeping those LOs happy and in place is so important for keeping your borrowers because that is the, that is the relationship that people are, uh, people are making their decisions based on. Sure. It's a great stat. I'm stealing it. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> All right. Well, if no one has anything else to add to that, we'll go ahead and move on to our next question. This is also a question for Kevin. How do you measure the impact to your business if you lose borrowers? Well, there's there's a couple things. So, you know, we we talked about how many loans a, a borrower potentially does in the future in their life. That's one. <clears throat> That's very measurable. Um, you know, when you have triggers and you can see if someone you know, pull their credit. You know, if you have a sales boomerang trigger, you see someone pull their credit elsewhere, you know, you can follow up with that bar and see if you ultimately won or lost that deal. I mean, it's measurable ROI and you get to watch where that person's going. But I think, um, 
you know, another one, I'm kind of, you know, maybe teasing up some of the future slides here, but what if you, you know, you're a lender like me and you're in my position, what if you, you know, you don't go do a good job of helping keep your borrowers together with your originators, your originators will leave your company. Your originators will go do this on their own, or they will go to another company that does a better job. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I, there's four of us that own this company and we love all three of our channels, whether it's an originator, wholesale, correspondent, or retail. And we have to arm them with these tools to make sure that we can monitor their borrowers and help them keep these relationships or they'll just take their business elsewhere, you know? And so, um, and, and that's in all three channels. I mean, you know, if we don't, if we don't help our originators help themselves, someone else will. And that is a very measurable impact when you lose um, loyal partners, originators that are either in your retail channel or um, a partner in your third party channel, and they just don't want to work with you anymore. That's very measurable. And then of course you're out of business. Yeah. And, and just, just to jump in on this, if, if, uh, if anyone that's listening remembers uh, and, and there's a, there, we can probably post a link to this too. We just did a, a case study, an entire white paper on the retention piece of it. And like what 1% means to a business. So if like, if you have 20,000 customers adding an additional retention of 1% is $1.25 million to your business, just, to, just improving by 1%. If you go backwards, right? If you lose 1%, that's 1.25 million real dollars that you didn't get, but there's a bigger thing. And, and, and uh, uh, Kevin is alluding to it, uh, is that look, when you have customers that, that come back to you, and, and I love Kevin's position of, you know, let's make sure our, our loan officers are taken care of because if they are sticking with us, the customers are sticking with them. And then it's, it's that retention all the way around. It's, it's my team and they're gonna, re, and they're gonna retain their customers. But the best part about re, retaining them is the other two R words, right? Repeat business, referrals, right? Like you can't get a referral from someone that never works with you again. That's just not gonna happen. Um, and so, you know, and, and, and I'm sure David's gonna jump in with some things about this because it's important to know when to offer information and, and to have that information handy. Um, so, so David, I, I, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the first thing I'd start out with is that this idea that your borrower sat and your LO sat are different and should be measured set, like they're so intertwined. You are not going to have happy borrowers if your LOs are jumping left and right. And conversely, uh, you're not gonna have happy LOs if the borrowers aren't having a great experience either. Right? They're like, why, why, why am I doing this? And so uh, we like to really emphasize that first you need to start measuring the satisfaction on both of those, both of those constituents. And then second part, is look for ways to use technology like sales boomerang, like capacity to help enhance uh, that part of the conversation. I saw another stat the other day talking about the satisfaction of borrowers. If you get a follow-up call, it's very high. If you get a follow-up text, was very high. If they find information on the website uh, via email, pretty high, then had to go to the website themselves. And then if the borrower had to call in on their own to get the info, Stat the the, the uh, borrower sat was just just over the over the cliff, and mm. so uh, we think technology like like both of ours, and I'm I'm happy to say that we uh, have a sales boomerang integration now, which I'm super super jazzed about. Uh, but technology yes. like ours can uh, truly help transform both your internal and external experiences, and do that in conjunction with each other rather than separately. I love it. <clears throat> you know, you said you said something. I, I want to maybe want to share like a personal story with our company. So mm -hmm. our founder and CEO, Paul Rozo, a few years ago, about four or five years ago, was having a conversation um, with one of our wholesale uh, account executives. And she said, um, hey, Paul, have you ever read the book Raving Fans? He's like, no, I hadn't. And, you know, it's a very short, quick read. It's about customer service. And he read it and he had this epiphany. And, you know, basically at our company, we have the saying, you know, we're built by originators for originators. So our customer at our company is the retail originator, the wholesale originator, or the wholesale account executive, mm. or the branch manager and retail. So then he made all our different departments at our corporate headquarters read the book, okay? Accounting, finance, licensing, secondary, marketing, and then do a report to him in the boardroom, how are they gonna give plus one service every day for our customer, which is the originator, the AE, the branch manager. So he made them do that report. 
And so it's not, it's not the realtor. It wasn't the borrower. It wasn't the tech. It wasn't the ROI on the portfolio. Our client is the originator, is the AE, is the branch manager, and we want them to be raving fans. And so uh, I just thought, you know, you guys had my, my gears turning, and I thought it was a really cool leadership exercise um, on how to put perspective in, in all this business. And maybe we could share that with our audience, and they can take that kind of idea back to their own team. I love it. Listen, that's that's the that's the secret that gives you guys the the and and the and the cool thing about this. And I know we have to move on, but the cool thing about this is you didn't do it because it was like something you read about doing. You did it because you believed in it. Like that's that's your that's your client, and you guys are going to do everything to support that. That's that's probably the the the, the fuel in the tank that takes you guys to where you guys have gotten to. Amen. And then uh, I'll thanks, really. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, David. I was just going to say it ties very closely. So our, our mission at Capacity is to help teams do their best work. That's yeah. the, the why of why we started the company, why we do what we do, why we are excited to bring this technology into uh, you know, the hands of Kevin and, and his team. So. Yeah. Well, that all really ties in well with our next question, which is also for Kevin. What are some of the main reasons a lender loses a Oh, I'm sorry. That was our last question. No, no, that's that's the right oh, one. No, nope, that is right. So sorry, y'all. What is <laughs> no. the reason a lender loses a borrower? I, I, I think uh, what I've noticed actually is uh, is relying solely on technology, mm. right? So, um, and I, I know we're getting some feedback. I don't know if somebody's got something going on, um, but I, I, um, I noticed. You know, I had a conversation. I remember I was at the mortgage mastermind. And we were talking to a couple of our um, our our top uh, originators who were there on the retail side, and they said, you know, our CRM sucks, you know, because I lost these bars. And I'm like, well, when was the last time you did a loan for them? We're well, like two years ago. I go, when was the last time you talked to them? They're like two years ago. I'm like, okay, you know, you you can't rely solely on tech. Technology is there to save you time, to make you more efficient, to help you scale, to help you do more and have more touches, but there is nothing that replaces a phone call or a personal visit now that we're coming out of this crazy bat soup induced pandemic recession. So you know, you <laughs> get back in touch with people and, and literally get back to old school relationship sales, which is probably the main thing that people lose sight of and that's why they lose a borrower. Yeah, I mean, we can go into all the different reasons, but I think I think you've 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 nailed one of the ones that people really skip over. We can all talk about rates and we can all talk about quality of certain, but you nailed it. When you just rely on on tech and nothing else and don't don't bring your yourself to the to the party, um, you know you're gonna you're gonna lose those customers. So that's I, I think that was a, a great great response. David, do you want to add anything to that before we move on? You are on mute. I think the only thing I would add to that is that I think the best technology helps people be more human, right? You, you can't uh, you can't do every single step of the loan manually anymore, obviously. Um, so letting people do the things that people do well, calling that person, having a conversation, and checking in and seeing what they need, those are great tasks for people to do pushing you know, information back and forth, uh, making somebody sign uh, an updated version of the same document for the fourth, fourth time. Like these are not human-centric tasks that, that humans want to engage in. So I think the best technology actually helps uh, both borrower and lender be more human. Yeah, or have more time to be human. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I couldn't, couldn't have said it any better. All right. Well, y'all are killing it with these segues because our next <laughs> touches on that. Um, and this question is for Alex. What is borrower intelligence and how does it impact the customer relationship? So look, the way to, the way to look at borrower intelligence is, is just, it's actually going back to being human. So you're right. This is a great segue. Um, you know, borrower intelligence is really just asking yourself, do I care to know what is happening in my customer's life? If the answer is yes to that, then borrower intelligence gives you that information served up to you in the way that you want it served up in a location that you want it served up, right? Especially the automated part of the borrower intelligence. And so it's about understanding what's happening in your borrower's life and knowing 
when to contact them and for what reason and making them the center of attention and not your sales targets, right? And so it's letting you know when somebody in your database, your customer base, even people you've turned down, um, when they're ready for the next loan and which loan they're ready for and why they benefit from this loan with you. Um, and, and that's, you know, and if we just to wrap that up in a, in a simple answer, that's what borrower intelligence is, is just the insights that give you what you need to know about your customers so that you can serve them as David and Kevin mentioned to, uh, earlier, you can serve them in a more human way because what happens now without this intelligence, without these insights, is there's a lot of phishing, right? And, and a lot of the messages that are, are meant to be heard for good reasons are lost because there's a lot of filler conversations. There's a lot of phishing conversations. And we as consumers start to question, right? We start to question, why is this person reaching out to me, right? The most important messages get lost when it's mixed in with some uh, unknown conversations, just just random questions that, that don't really seem to help me, the customer, but seem to help you fill things in um, and, and hopefully, you know, see where the dots connect and say, oh, you fit into this kind of, kind of product. And so, again, back to the human part of it, of what David and Kevin were talking about, Borrower intelligence helps you to be more human and to contact the customer and to be the advisor and to really put them on a path that's best for them and and, and only deliver those good news and, and ways that you can help them and rather than just, just fish for information and see if you can fit them in a box of some sort. So that's what borrower intelligence is. And 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 just to sort of you know explain on on a on a slightly different level of borrower intelligence, the way that we at Sales Boomerang approach it is intelligence without automation creates work for the human again, right? You have to go back to compute. And, and we luckily have enough computers. We have the relationship with David, a capacity that allows you to just speak to someone, uh, a computer to give you information that you don't have to dig through it and try to type and find out. You can, you can get this information automatically. And that's a big part of, big part of how, how we operate. Let's, let's automate as much of this as possible so that you can do the human tasks that a computer can't do for you, which is the laughing and the crying and the sharing of stories and connecting uh, to humans. So just wanted to make sure that that was bridged in there. Yeah, just, just to add to that, uh, I've got four kids, nine, seven, five, and four. And mm -hmm. my oldest two are starting to get their first mail. And when they get a letter, it's like, oh, I've got this letter and it's personalized and it's written to them and they're, they've got a couple pen pals and that, that sort of thing. Or think back to, I can remember when I was younger, when email first came in, I got an email today. Wow, what was in it, right? You compare that type of experience to the spray and pray, mass number of emails, mass number of mailers, no personalization, no customization, no uh, understanding of what's going on in my life. And they're like diametrically opposed to each other, right? My kids think I get email and physical mail. They think it's like all their personalized letters that they get. Uh, from their aunt, their, their pen pal. And so uh, with technology like sales boomerang and capacity and combination, you, you actually have the opportunity to put a little bit of that wonder back in the equation. Mm -hmm. I love that. And David, we'll stick with you for this next question. Yeah. What is workflow automation and how does it impact the customer relationship? Yeah, so when we think about uh, our, our own evolution, you know, we started out with answering people's questions on your website internally for your LOs and your underwriting desk. And we added this thing we call guided conversations where you can have uh, more of an in-depth conversation with the bot. But we recognized early on that there are going to be processes where you can't complete that process in a single session and you need to coordinate multiple people and multiple systems together. And so the way we think about workflows is we want to take a process that you have internally map it to a workflow, go through each of the individual steps of that workflow, and over time, assign as many of those steps to the bot as possible, and then let the human steps be as human as they can. So if one of the steps is calling the borrower, like put that on, send a reminder, put it on your, on your calendar, send a, send a text to your phone and make that happen. Uh, but we wanna make sure that every process within your org can be mapped, it can be tracked, and you can understand what are the bottlenecks, what's keeping things from moving through these, these various stages. And then how can we make sure that 
uh, by creating a better process, a more automated process, a more efficient process, it also becomes a more human-centric process. And I think when we do that, uh, borrowers take notice, loan officers take notice, et cetera. That's great. And before we move on to our next question, I'm just going to remind our audience that if at any point you have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat or use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Yeah, let us know you're still awake. <laughs> you're out there, you're listening. <laughs> All right. Well, this next question is for Kevin. How does your tech stack, tech stack help you retain both loan originator and the borrower? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I think we've kind of covered a lot of it, you know, making sure we create efficiency and time. Um, and maybe I can get into maybe some specific examples. You know, um, you know, let's talk about point of sale. You know, we've got originators out there that still get on the phone and go through line by line with a borrower, a loan application. Now, let, let's say that, let's just say, for example, it takes 30 minutes, okay? I know we got people that are much better and quicker, <clears throat> but you know, why would you sit there and go, how many dependents do you have? Oh, oh, you have four. Okay. Um, they're, they're, they're how old? And then, you know, you go through them all, you know, 14, nine, seven, and five, and then you write it all down and you go, okay. And then you get to the last page. You're like, okay, are you a co-endorser on a note? Um, are you a first time home buyer? So imagine if you sent out a link, you had a point of sale, right? Something like, um, like a blend, right? Um, or a simple nexus. Then the application comes back and then you read it before you get on the phone. You already know they have four kids. So instead of asking the question, they're writing the information down, you go, hey, I see you have four kids. Are you moving because you're trying to find a better school? Because I know some really good areas. The same amount of time you took to go through and answer all the mundane questions over the phone, you could actually be deepening a relationship and connecting to them. Go, oh, that's cool. Your kids are getting pen pal letters and they're getting their first mail. That's awesome. My kid has this pen pal uh, named Kumal in Ethiopia and she sends letters to him. That's pretty cool. That is a different dynamic than spending that time, you know, asking mundane questions. Plus you may be able to do everything in 20 minutes. So then, you know, you've connected more in 20 minutes than taking a loan application in 30. So what are you going to do, you know, with that extra 10 minutes for eight different applications you took that day? I mean, you know, pushing an hour and a half, you know, extra time almost, you know, uh, throughout the day. So anyway, I just, um, I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty amazing to talk about how this kind of tech gives you time back in, in, in a realistic standpoint. And so I'll give an example about capacity. Um, and David, you don't, I didn't, I didn't share this with you before we, we got on, but you know, we have a good <laughs> example. Yeah. Oh, it's a great example. I mean, I'm just kidding. We, no, you know, we, well, we rolled out the, uh, the first bot with you guys for an FAQ page a year ago. Like as soon as the pandemic hit, we put out a page and you guys stood it up quick. I mean, super quick. We had a lot of questions. I mean, we we're over 2000 employees last year. We're over 2,900 employees right now. And it's like, okay, do I have to come to work? Do I need, you know, what's going on? What is the protocol for this? What's the protocol for that? There's, you know, a lot of the same questions. Now we hire as many as a hundred to 150, maybe 200 people per month. Right. And, and so that's a lot of new people asking a lot of the same questions that you would when you join a new company, okay? So here's an example of maybe HR guidelines and workflow automation tied into our Encompass system. I'm a loan officer, I'm laying in bed, it's midnight and I can't sleep because I've got these things in my mind. Um, hey, uh, capacity, well, we call ours Moby, so uh, business intelligence, M-O-B-I. Hey Moby, um, are we, is PRMG open MLK day? PRMG is closed. Hey, what's the status on the Smith file? Clear to close. Um, what's the waiting period for bankruptcy on a conventional loan? Seven years. Okay, good night. Psh. I mean, three questions, three answers, super quick. You know, it's just, it's, you got to give your people time back so you can scale. That, mm -hmm. that, those are real life examples. Um, and, and again, our meeting this morning, our tech meeting this morning, the person running point in our project, she is like, she was like excited. She's like, I cannot wait to roll out Moby. It was awesome because she doesn't, it's not really like that, but you know, she runs all of our training and product development and our deal desk. Um, and so it's just amazing to hear the excitement that someone's getting knowing that they're going to have this, you know, huge time saver um, using one of our tech partners. So uh, it was just, it was just, it's very cool. And I, I thought maybe um, kind of giving some real life examples of how we're using this tech and what it can do and what it is doing 
for us, I thought that would probably resonate with their audience a little bit more. Thanks, Kevin. We, yeah, we love to see, uh, like I said, we love to see that the glimmer in the eye. You're like, wow, <laughs> I can save time and create a better experience. A lot of times you can do one or the other, uh, but ha- doing both at the same time is awesome. Amen. And, and so, so to sort of piggyback off of, the, off of the question of like, you know, how does it retain the loan originator and the borrower? Look, this is so like, <laughs> I want you, I want everyone on this call to think about this for a minute. I want, I want everyone to kind of go back and experience going to a hotel room right now and having a DVD player, okay? And to watch the movie you want to watch, you got to go downstairs and ask them or you got to call room service and they got to bring you a DVD, Think about that for just a minute. Did you ever go back to that hotel? No, right? So like having having capacity, having sales boomerang, having all the things, and by the way, uh, Kevin and, and the team at PRMG really stacks it up for their team. You retain good people because you give them all the resources to be the best that they could be with as little effort as possible. Ask three questions. I got my answers. I'm off to my to my four kids and watching watching a movie, right? Like, awesome. Like that could take hours. That could take waiting for an email response. That could take all kinds of things. And then you're 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 stressed. So when you retain, we talked about this. When you retain a a, a loan originator, you have a much higher chance to retain the the borrower, right? Because it's that same it's that same group of people working with the same customers, right? So it's very important. And so when you have a tech stack that makes life easy. They don't want to go and, and make things complicated. You don't know how many times I've heard people uh, people tell me that they will, if somebody's trying to recruit them, they'll be like, all right, do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? Yes or no? Like you say no to one of those, I'm not coming, right? And 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 that's and that's a fact. And I know, Kevin, you you experience that. Like people stay with you guys. And I've heard, I've heard the stories of how many years you've had people at your company. There's a good reason for that because you have made them your number one customers, your team, and you support that and stand by it with technologies like sales boomerang and capacity in there. And then, so, so to flip that now, so now you've retained your originator, how do you help the borrower stay, stay um, in the game here and stay with you? Same thing, this technology, these technologies give your, your, your loan originator the ability to contact the customer. Look, we're going into a, into a time right now where if we talked about this earlier, it could be years, it could be years before you know when your customer may be ready for a loan. Are you gonna guess about it? Are you going to know it? There's no reason to guess anymore. There is no reason to guess ever again. You don't have to guess. You can know exactly when your customers need your help. You can plan. You can be proactive. You can get to your customer before your customer gets to the market. You can ask everything you want from Moby. Um, and, and that's just some, you guys named it Moby, but I think, uh, David, people name it different things, right? Yeah, you can brand it with whatever branding. We even have some clients that have a different internal versus external branding just to, just to deline- delineate between the two. Yeah, so so you have you have this access to a personal um, assistant, if you will, right? Your own personal assistant. That's a that's a mass scale personal assistant that does the research for you instantly, delivers back information to, hey, uh, hey, hey, Moby. I'm just going to use that for now. Hey, Mo- Moby, who uh, who's qualified for a conventional cash out right now? Here they are. Here it is. Right. Capacity sales boomerang working together, let you know who you need to call right now today, right? Hey, uh, capacity who, or, or hey, Moby, who uh, in my database had a credit improvement notification over the last three months? Boom, here they are. Um, how many of them were in, were in California? Here, here you go, right? It's all delivered to you right there. There's no reason to overserve your borrowers, which means they're sticking with you and your, and your loan officers are right there along with you. So, um, you know, that tech stack, again, Kevin, the way you've done it, and, and uh, it's, just, it's just beautiful. And it's noticeable in the number of people that, that want to stay with your organization. Well, let me, let, me, let me just take this down a completely different direction. I'm going to be, I'm going to put a big dark cloud on everything right now, and then I'm going to pull you back, okay? So let's say... The worst case scenario plays out in our business, okay? Let's say the Amazon effect is fully baked in. What does that mean for us? What does that mean for a company who says we're built by originators for originators? Okay, so here's, so remember that old saying, it says, you know, cheaper, better, faster, pick two. You can't have all three. Right. If there's anything that Amazon has shown us, it's actually, you can have all three. And so one of the things that we talk about at, uh, at PRMG, and it's nice to see some larger lenders stole my line. I love it. I love when people take this, but I always say- Biggest compliment. <laughs> I love it. Better, faster, cheaper. Cheaper is price. That comes last for a reason. We say better first. So it's better, faster, cheaper, all three. Now, if you see all these billions of dollars 
of fintech and disruption that's coming our way. They're, mar they're trying to marginalize the real estate agent. They think that, oh, you, you know, you're just out there showing them the kitchen. What do you what do you have to offer? You don't provide value. You know, you're not just because you grew up in the neighborhood and you've been there for 30 years. You know everything about everything and everyone in the neighborhood. That's mm -hmm. not that that's not value to us. We're just going to, you know, show a little online 3D thing and people are going to buy these houses sight unseen. In fact, we're going to buy them sight unseen and give instant cash. And then we're going to take over that process and we're going to marginalize the real estate agent. Well, what about the originator? Right. Well, I could just click a button and get a mortgage, right? That's all I need. That's all I have to do, which is so easy, right? And so the worst case scenario that plays out is our real estate agents and our originators in our business, who we love so much, there's going to be a lot less of them. And they're going to be working for less. And they have to do more and working for less. That is the worst case scenario. But you know what we have? We're local. We all win local. And you know what we have? We have FinTech on our side. Mm -hmm. Here you got Capacity and Sales Boomerang who are working for us. They're working for the little guy. They're working for the underdog. It's nice to have some top tier tech in our corner. And David, you're the most humble dude. And I know no one's going to say, you're never going to tell this story. But dude, you built Answers.com. You literally built like a $900 million company and <laughs> sold it, took some years off. And when you came back, you know where you came back to? our industry and you're focusing on us out the gate. I mean, it's really nice to see that there are people that have artificial intelligence chops and development chops and FinTech chops that are working for us and not the billionaires. So I, I just, I love how it's all coming together. And these are the kinds of things we have to do to fight, to survive. And if we thrive, then even better. <laughs> well said. It's well said. Well, on that enthusiastic note, we're going to turn over to some audience questions, which is great because we've got some good ones stacking up here. Um, first off, what sort of leading indicators slash data are you looking at to understand future borrower behavior? I'll open that one up to any three of y'all. Yeah, so so I'll, I'll jump in there. So, you know, there's there's a ton. And so I want to make sure I understand personally understand the question before I give this answer. It's what are we looking for within a consumer or a borrower's life to help us understand when they may need another loan or a better loan. Right. Um, is that is that the question, I think. Right. Nicholas. Yep, exactly. Perfect. Here. Thank yep, you. Thank you said exactly. <laughs> Good. I just want to repeat and make sure we're answering the right question and we're not going off into left field. So. So, look, first things first, it's understanding what what situation the borrower is in now. What's, if they have a loan, what loan are they in? If they're not in a loan, um, then how can they be qualified for a loan? So we're looking for things like, you know, if they have a loan, where's their current rate? Where's their equity? Where's their credit? What what sort of situations are they going through personally in their life um, that, that may indicate this is time for a conversation? Do they have kids college age and um, they, they have so much equity in their house that they don't have to worry about getting a student loan if they use their house properly, right? Because remember, a mortgage is a financial vehicle and Kevin can talk to this more than, more than any of us on this call, but it's a financial vehicle. Most people in the United States don't understand that it's a financial vehicle. They think it is just a place they live, they pay off and hopefully they make some money when they sell it. But the truth is the smartest people who live in their homes they understand that their house is more than just a place to live, more than just a roof over their head. And so understanding people's situations, we're looking for all of those indicators. And then this is the best part. Personally, at Sales Boomerang, we're looking for all of this information about each individual consumer. We're not putting people in um, in, in buckets or, or in, in different categories. Everyone is in their own individual category. Seven billion people in, the, in seven billion different categories who have their own lives that we are looking at for an individual reason, right? There's nobody that's gonna get the exact same offer as Alex, same as offer as David, same offer as Kevin. Everyone is gonna have something catered to them because their situations are different. Same thing Kevin was saying. If I've lived in a neighborhood for 30 years, yeah, you could probably do this, buy this house without me, but you're not gonna understand the neighborhood like I'm gonna explain it to you. If you're coming from a different state, you want some insights as to why you should buy this house and not that house, even though that house is priced better, here's why. Because I understand you at a human level and I can advise you to do this. You just told me you wanna be within five minutes of, 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 your, uh, of your work. Well, even though that house seems closer, there's no exit this way. You have to go around. And that, But people don't think about that when they just buy online, right? And so that's kind of when we look at, at, at indicators and information, we look at how is it going to serve the consumer and how is it going to be the easiest for the lender to bring that message to that consumer? Um, so I hope that answers your question, Nicholas. 
All right. And Alex, I think you already claimed this one in the chat, but from Bruce, oh. what great ideas do you have for getting new, for getting good new realtors? The good ones have established relationships. Oh my goodness. Kevin is going to love this one. Um, so look, <laughs> it's, so one of the things that I learned very quickly in the mortgage space is that realtors are very important for the, for, for, for lenders, but it's always been one way. It's always been, you know, referral here, please. And so with something like borrower intelligence, with the automation and with us being able to discover opportunities, and by the way, uh, to a tune of nearly 100% of your database could trigger, not every person, but 100% of they could trigger within 12 months, have an event that means they could be ready for a mortgage, right? So if, if that's happening inside a mortgage database, it's the same people that live inside a realtor's database, but the realtors don't have access to it. So how do you get realtors to join your network? You show them how many opportunities they're missing out of their database today, right? Literally, when somebody partners with Kevin and his team and they say, hey, I'm a realtor, I want to really work with you closely. Anyone that partners with a loan officer that's using Sales Boomerang with PRMG, that realtor will double their volume in the first 12 months, period. That just happens every time. It's just magic. And so how do you get those realtors? You show them, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Realtor, you have 500 people in your database. How many homes did you sell last year? Oh, 10. That's pretty good. What if you did 24 this year? I can show you how from, and, and you wouldn't have to go outside of your database to do that. You can do that within your own database to add another 12 to, to 14 opportunities today. So how you do that is, is you show, you bring those realtors into your world and you show them all the insights that you're getting and you share those insights. Every time you get one, you share it with that realtor. You don't hold it back. So one quick, one quick uh, uh, tip or secret, anytime, anytime, if you're getting it through Sales Boomerang or some other source that you find out one of your customers is back in the market, thinking about getting back in the market, even if it's a refi, no matter what, your first call is to the realtor. Hey, our mutual client, they're active again. I think I'm going to do a refi for them. I think it's worth reaching out to them. It's like, why would I want to tell my realtor about a refi? Because there's this village effect, okay? When you hear from the same people over and over again, you feel like you're part of something. You don't feel like you just bought, it wasn't a transaction anymore. Now there's a relationship. And when your realtor calls and says, hey, congratulations, um, Kevin, on, on, this, on this new refi or this, that you're, you know, you're working with Kevin on a refi. Oh, you're not selling me anything? You're, you're just calling a congrats? Yeah, I'm just, just happy for you. All of a sudden, there's a whole different level of, of, of relationship there. Um, as, as Kevin alludes to all the time, right? Relationship is everything. That's a whole different level of relationship. So two things, always contact your realtor, no matter what. If you're looking to get a new realtor, show them. Literally send them an email that says subject line. I had 34 referrals I sent to my realtor partners uh, last, last month. I'd like to add one more person to my network. Would you like to be that one? Who's not responding to that? I want some of those referrals too, right? So there's a little... A little secret that's for you guys. A, that's some FOMO right there you just created. I mean, I, I, I know uh, I'm going to totally set you up here with a softball, but I know you're, you have a team that's coming to join you that is, you know, basically behavioral yeah. scientists, the behavioral psychologists. They teach you how to, how to write things in a way that creates that FOMO effect, like what you just said. Not everyone speaks that way. You know, yeah. hey, I've got one more spot. Do you want it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, in short order to answer that question, I would just say, well, just give that realtor a lead. You know, give them a listing, you know, give them business yeah. and, you know, scratch their back. Hopefully they'll scratch you. But, you know, there's obviously, you know, more, uh, you know, nuanced ways of doing it and saying that, um, you know, I want to I want to give you something, Alex, and everyone here that's listening. Um, I want to give you a gift that I've been using internally for a couple of years, mm -hmm. but you can borrow and steal this. So traditionally, you know, one of the one of the things you guys monitor and trigger are life events. So you're using this is kind of answering some, one of the other questions in there. Yep. You guys have a couple of different sets of data. Some of it's public, but some of it is um, credit data, credit mover data from the agencies that you guys curate and fashion and put it in a way that's usable. Um, and that includes life events. And in our business, um, everyone kind of says the four D's. It's actually the six D's. OK, so <laughs> if you haven't heard it anywhere, it's the six D's. You ready? You got ready. diapers, diamonds, divorce, death, debt and downsizing. It's mm. 6D. Those are your life events. So you heard it here first. You are all free to use it and steal it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but you know, that, that's the kind of intel bar intelligence that you can use to yeah. strike up a conversation. Hey, you know, I know I hear you're downsizing. Um, you know, kids are out of the house. Oh, someone, you know, um, you're in debt. You know, here's a cash out, you know, and you obviously can go through all this, all the D's, but 
the point is, you know, there are times in people's life where they look to the biggest asset that they mm -hmm. own, the biggest wealth creator in America, which is real estate, which is why you got to have a conversation with people who rent and go, you're a sucker. You're making a landlord rich. You're paying 100% interest rate on your money and you're doing nothing for that. You have to have a roof over your head. Great. You live in an area where you can't afford to buy the house. Go out of town and then let some appreciation gather over time, then come back in and get into that door that you want later. So these are conversations when we're teaching financial literacy, when we're helping people have dinged up credit, right? You know, like our friends over there get credit healthy. You know, there's, they help borrowers get their credit score up over time and establish that relationship when maybe they're not ready to build or, or buy right away. You know, you gotta kind of help them along. Call centers don't do that. They just flush them out the door when you can help someone build their credit to get into a house that builds their wealth for generations to come. That's it. I think, I think, by the way, all of you listening that are originators, I think Kevin just gave you guys a great tip to give to your realtors and a great campaign. Realtors need to be sending out advertisements that say you're paying a hundred percent interest. Would you ever pay a hundred percent interest in anything? But you are now time to buy, right? There's, there's your campaign. Beautiful. Just go door knock, go, just go drop flyers on handles in apartment complexes in yeah. really expensive apartment complexes. I mean, there's some places where rent's like three thousand, thirty five hundred bucks a month. Just go, you know, you're paying this for rent. Why are you paying? You're pissing your money away. You're paying 100%. from 100 percent to three percent. I mean, what else do you need to say? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> what else? All we right, got? That was, David, do you have anything to add to that or are we good to move on to the next one? <laughs> all right. Well, moving on to the next one, um, is borrower intelligence provided all based on public information? Have you encountered any data or privacy issues? Yeah. So that, that was something that Kevin was alluding to. Um, so we follow all the privacy laws and all the privacy, uh, the, the acts, uh, especially, you know, California rolled it out and we are following that across the board and everywhere. It doesn't matter if it's not out in other States, we're kind of following that exact same process because we think it's going to happen everywhere. Um, so, so no, we haven't run into any of those issues at all. Yeah, I can attest to that. Our uh, data privacy system securities teams, vendor manager, everyone that just absolutely hammers all of our vendors before we yeah. sign up, we've already vetted it all. Perfect. All right, moving on then. I like I like this one a lot. Um, heard that Google will do mortgage using AI as well. If all are automatically on online based, what transition for our LO role to compete with AI? So so let me let me just kind of answer that because you know, there was again. an article that came. <laughs> no, Keep going, Kevin. Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, apologize. Um, I, I just was going to kind of get in there. There was an article that came out regarding Google and their partnership. And I know that they partner with a point of sale company and they offer their borrower data. You know, Amazon kind of does the same thing. There's some kind of secret stuff going on behind the scenes. You know, they don't they don't want to be a regulated lender or bank or anything, but they have no problem, you know, using their data or giving their data to companies to help pull in bars or give you know, some of this borrower intelligence. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all about execution. You know, I mean, you can have the best data in the world, but if you don't know how to get the phone to ring or get in touch with the bar and get them to click on your link or get them to call you or whatever, you know, it's, it's just a headline that is like, oh, wow, Google's my enemy. No, I mean, you can buy Google data. You could buy Facebook data. You can advertise on any of those places, you know? So uh, any one of us can do it on an individual level. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I just... I wanted to get that in there because it was kind of a headline that came out in an article last year and um, we're not scared. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what I'd add to that, when you look at the battles between Google and Amazon, you know, people have asked, and Google's got all this great tech, lots of smart people, why were they not able to be successful in selling books and building out a commerce marketplace in, in, in comparison? Obviously they're big on advertising, but real, scale large scale commerce they, they haven't done well and the reason for that i would posit is that amazon figured out that as much as they are a customer experience company and they are they are a logistics company as well think about all the logistics that goes into uh, taking a book from 
uh, publisher to the warehouse, packaging it up, shipping it, getting it to your front door and having that happen in two days or one day or a couple of hours now. They're, they're very much, uh, they're very much focused on the logistics of, of that process, which Google is not good at. I think very similarly, the best, uh, the, the best mortgage companies understand that they are both in the customer experience business and they are a logistics company at the end of the day. And so part of that logistics is that you need to have a well-trained, uh, well, uh, kind of a, a, a deeply set relationship between the LO and the borrower. And that, that is part of the logistics that, that, that happened there in soliciting the information you need, working your way through the process, et cetera. And so I think what, if I, if I was going to say the advice that I, I want to see more uh, companies take on, it's how do we think of ourselves uh, like Amazon does of having this fantastic borrower experience, but also being the best logistics operator in the business. I, I, I love that. I, and I've, I'm just, uh, my mind's always blown every time, you know, you speak, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's a great way to position that. I mean, think about why is it, you know, why is it encompass? Why haven't they been disrupted? Why do they still have such massive market share? It's because it is hard. The logistics behind the scenes to build out all the APIs, to do all the calculations, to do all the stuff it takes to manufacture a loan. It is hard. It is tough logistics. There's a reason why a lot of these online companies, they don't do manual FHA underwrites. They don't want to touch second liens. They don't want to do down payment assistance programs. But you know who that matters to? A first time home buyer getting help for the single biggest hurdle to home ownership, getting into a, you know, the down payment, doing a loan that's a Chinoa loan or a mass housing loan or something like that. These big online companies that, you know, are into like the easiest logistics that you can, you know, automate or assembly line out they don't touch those loans because they're hard they're very hard so you know logistics is a great way to put it and you know that's why i still believe you know having an underwriter that will get on the phone and walk through what's wrong with the file and solve the problem just like having a local originator or a local real estate agent get on the phone and say i got a guy that will do the hedges for you this school sucks don't go to that neighborhood all those kinds of things it's all logistics and trying to help someone get into the home and it's not always easy to do so i, I love that it's actually a great way to put it and i'm totally going to steal that too feel it kevin it's yours that that is oh. that is a great one and talk about logistics for a second kevin you guys know this in covid uh was there not parking lot signatures right were you not were you not meeting people in cars and getting signatures done because people weren't uncomfortable you know going into each other's houses or meeting in person yeah talk about logistics. How, about e how about e closing you know yeah. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, I'll get to it at some point. I get to it at some point. The title companies are like, don't come in our office. I don't want a bad virus, you know? So now everyone's like, all right, I guess I got to go do e-hybrid closings, you know? So everyone, like we pulled forward our second half year project and we pulled forward an e-hybrid closing solution, you know? And, um, and so anyway, it was just, you know, yeah, logistics, it changes. It can change quickly. It can change fast. So I, I just, you know, I agree with that. That's a great example, Alex. Yeah. All about logistics. All right, we just got another question. I think this is probably referencing those uh, 60s that Kevin was talking about. Um, but what is the borrower reaction? Um, what has it been when receiving a call from an LO or a real estate agent after finding out about a life event? Has it been positive or have people provided pushback? Well, that's a great question. Don't call someone, go, hey, I, I know someone died in the house, so you're looking for a mortgage. I mean, you know, it's all about approach, right? So, you know, hey, you know, we're here to help. We're local. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of different things that you could do and the way you say things. Um, and by the way, I don't have Alexa either. So that was, um, I, I, I just, already on my, you know, you know, they're in my home. So I'm just, I, for, for whatever reason, I just can't have Alexa in my home. I just don't want it. And they listen to you 24 seven, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's just a nuanced approach about, you know, um, about how you do it. You know, that again, you know, if someone is going through a divorce, you know, or if someone is downsizing, their kids are going out, you know, it, just talk to them in a human way. Like you would talk to your friend, you know, um, you wouldn't be laughing, you know, like, yeah, I knew you were going to divorce because, you know, your spouse kind of sucked and we just never told you, you know, it's about the way you approach it. Like, man, it sucks that you're going through this. How can I help you? What, how can I help you? Do you need my help? You know, I always find 
asking an open-ended friendly question that engages someone and just sit back and listen and let them talk. That's how I would approach, um, you know, any, any kind of conversation regarding a life event. So I think that's a great question. So, and, and let me, let me add to that um, as well. There's, there's a big difference from getting a call from a random company for something very personal to you. That is, that is off-putting, but it's, it's a completely different feeling when a company you've trusted to do your mortgage, which means they've seen more about you than your own family knows about you, right? Period. Like when, when you do a mortgage, you've basically said, look, you know everything about my life. You know everything I've done financially. You, you, you're there. And so when you get a call from somebody you've trusted that way before, that just like Kevin said, doesn't call and say, hey, Bob, I see you left Mary. Let's get you both a house. You're not saying that. What, what you're calling is you're being human and, and you're just asking questions. How's life? What's new? How can we help? Where are you headed? What's the next year look like for you? And, and you're contacting them. This is the most important part. You're contact, contacting them at a time that you know there's been an event, that you know that you can help, right? And so you can guide the conversation. Let's, you know, let's just say for, for, for some reason, you know, you know there, there was a baby born in, in a household, right? Somebody just had a baby. And you know they're living in a one-bedroom condo, right? You're, you're contacting them and you're saying, hey, what's new? that's all you hey what's new in life they'll be happy to share with you that they had a baby and then they'll say something very special and we hear this all the time i'm so glad you called how many originators can say that their customers go i'm so glad you called we had a baby seven months ago we we're growing out of this space we're actually looking for a place and we haven't started can you recommend a, a local realtor yeah of course we can right and, and then it's a whole different conversation. But as Kevin said, it's, you're being human about it, right? It's, it's not about pushing some, some bruises that may be hurting if somebody's passed away, if there's a divorce. You're coming at it in a very human way and you are the company that should be contacting them, not some random group, because they're your customer, right? They're your customer. It is actually your job to be there for them for that specific event. And so uh, great question. And, and Kevin, thanks for, for the way you put it together. I just kind of piggybacked off of you. We, we have, we, we have a seven D dogs. There you go. Melissa, Melissa, added, Melissa added dogs. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, my, my dog is enormous. I need a bigger yard. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's right. a real thing. I, I live in a condo. I need a house. <laughs> Yeah, I think that I think that would replace diapers, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we are running out of time here, but Alex, real fast, if you think you can do it in sixty seconds, what is the next step for Sales Boomerang slash Product Roadmaps? Didn't you see our April Fool's video? It's reading people's minds. That's 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 the next step. No. Um, so so look, it's I, I've answered this just recently in another interview. Um, it's it's the post loan. Right. So post loan process, how do you go from closing a loan to schedule the scheduling the next loan? That's what's coming is, is being able to schedule the loan the minute you're funding the existing loan. Um, and that's what we're very excited about bringing to the market, because then you go from from hoping to retain someone uh, at the industry being at a, at a measly 18 percent, not not KP and their team. They're closer to 60 percent, maybe even higher now. But going from an industry wide 18 percent to flipping those numbers to 81 percent. Right. So it's post loan. That's really the future. Is, is being able to schedule those things for your consumers so they don't ever have to guess if they're in a right loan for them. They already know what's coming next. Brother, you, you sent us stats. You said we're at 82%. Woo! That's, that's what I'm talking about. Thank you. 82% retention rate. Come on, man. That's what, that's what tech stack and good team will do for you. Absolutely. That's a, that's a win. All right. Well, thank you so much to all of our attendees and thank you to our three panelists. Um, if you submitted a question to the panel and we didn't have time to answer, uh, we'll be contacting you directly. Um, and then once again, Housing Wire will be sending out the webinar recording to all registrants within the next 24 hours. And the webinar will also be available in our Knowledge Center at housingwire.com. Thank you again so much for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.